Hello and welcome to the Violin Podcast. I am your host, Eric Mugala, where I interview violinists from around the world. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the Violin Podcast and give us a five-star rating after the interview today. My guest today is a rising star as a Baroque violinist and according to Seen and Heard International is considered an exceptional violinist. She has claimed grand prizes and... Concert Artist International was a finalist in the 2016 International Indianapolis Baroque Concerto Competition. Wow, that's a mouthful. And many more. Please let me welcome Augusta McKay Lodge. Augusta, thank you so much for coming on to this week's episode of the Island Podcast. Really nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Eric. Um, it's going to be really fun. Looking forward to this. Absolutely. For sure. So right now you're based in Paris, right? That's right. I moved here um, almost two years ago. Uh, from New York, and I'm currently in uh, shut down in my Paris apartment with COVID-19. Yes, and I definitely want to touch base on the COVID-19 pandemic and how you're doing, um, you know, musically speaking, and I want to talk about all the concerts that have been canceled, uh, especially with you. So we'll hopefully get to that topic. But before we do that, let's get to know you a little bit. What, what, who is Augusta McKay Lodge? I'm interested in knowing what you're all about, what your values are, what your priorities are. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and for the audience to get to know you? Sure. Well, I'm Augusta and um, let's see, where to start? (laughs) There's not that much to me. (laughs) Um, I grew up in Oberlin, Ohio. I grew up on a 50 acre farm that my parents have there just outside of the town. And um, I matriculated into Oberlin for my bachelor's, so I went to school near my home, which was really great. And I did a modern violin performance degree there. And then I went to Indiana University and did a modern degree there with Alex Carr. Um, And then I went to Juilliard after that for historical performance. So that was really fun. And then I moved to Paris almost two years ago, kind of on a lark. And I had one, I had one, job prospect with the orchestra here and so I knew I had like that one connection you know that one lead that I could kind of follow up on but I didn't have a lot of reasons to come here and I didn't know French yet so it's been quite the journey and um, has really challenged me and made me grow in in ways I really appreciate so that's been a really cool journey in the past two years. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that. I know that in my other podcast, in the Everyday Musician podcast, I have a violin colleague who talks about taking a leap of faith. And uh, that that's certainly what you did when moving to France. So what was going through your mind when you wanted to make that decision? Like, you know what? I had enough of the U.S. I want to go to Europe. <laughs> not, not that you don't love the U.S., but um, right. what, what kind of... You obviously had a job prospect, but what were some other reasons as to why you want to continue your musical journey there? Um, I had always been drawn to the music scene in Europe and had kind of, I don't know, like put my toe in the water a bit doing exchange programs. I had been to Amsterdam. Um, I had studied abroad quite a bit, but I never, you know, made the full on decision. Okay, I'm I'm going to do this. I'm going to go live in Europe. And when I graduated Juilliard, um, I had plenty of work in the States, but I, felt like I needed to just, I don't know, broaden my horizons a bit and make sure I was taking advantage of all the opportunities that were available to me. And so this conductor, um, William Christie, he recruited me while I was at Juilliard and um, asked me to come play some concerts with his orchestra, which is a really wonderful Baroque orchestra. And so, you know, I really wanted to jump on that. So I thought, well, I'm still young-ish and this is the time to to do it and see what living in Europe is like and just to go for it so why not try so I um, enrolled in a five-week intensive French course in the summer and got my French up to like a you know conversational level and moved over here and it just after that you know the ball was rolling and things happened and I made friends and it just kind of you know all fell into place after that but I have to say there wasn't a lot of thought behind it. It was just, like you say, a leap of faith. It was just sort of like, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. And I wouldn't say necessarily thought it through (laughs) to like a huge extent. I just kind of did it, which I think is really important. I think you have to, you know, follow your heart and just do things. And so that's what happened. Yeah. So you had no plan. You were like, you know what, 
might as well do this and we'll see what happens. I love that. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Augusta, so I want to talk about your transition into becoming a Baroque violinist, right? It's being a Baroque violinist has become a niche within the last decade or so. And I want to talk about your interest in the Baroque violin, uh, how that differs from playing a modern violin and wondering what your thoughts are on that. Mm -hmm. um, I discovered Baroque violin 10 years ago now. I think that's when I started, or maybe 11 years, but it's been a long time actually. Um, I was studying at Oberlin Conservatory, which I, I went to the conservatory really young because I was homeschooled and I was right there. It was in my backyard. Um, so I started my bachelor's, I was actually 15 and a half when I started. Um, so <laughs> it was 10 years ago that I start, you know, was there and I had the opportunity to study Baroque violin at the conservatory with Marilyn McDonald. And I took this class with her, it was like a group class. And that was the first time I picked up an instrument and um, gave it a whirl. Um, and I wouldn't say I took to the physical instrument right away. It's very, very different from the modern violin. And it's very difficult at first to, you know, to figure out how you're going to balance the violin um, without the chin rest, without the shoulder rest, and how you're going to get a good sound out of it with the gut strings. So that was difficult, but the actual historical performance practice, the Baroque music, that sound, I was really used to. I had always been interested in that um, without even consciously realizing that there was like a difference, that, that, was, that it was historical performance practice. I thought it was just music making. And I owned a lot of CDs, like I had Rachel Podgers, Bach sonatas and partitas, and I had Elizabeth Walfish playing Bach concerti. So I was used to listening to Baroque music played in a historical way. So that was fine. That was quick and easy to catch on to. Um, and then when I got to Indiana, I realized that at that point, Baroque violin had just kind of morphed into my life without me even realizing it. And when I started studying with Stanley Ritchie alongside my modern teacher, Alex Carr, um, I realized I'd just totally fallen in love with the process and what historical performance practice is and um, the sound and the people and the instrument and it all just came together and then I decided to follow that through. That's awesome. So I didn't know that you studied both modern and Baroque while you were in Indiana. Can you talk about that experience while you were at Indiana and describe the, the difference in techniques for someone who is completely unfamiliar with a uh, broke violin versus a modern violin that we play on today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I have to say that um, Alex, my teacher, who I love dearly, was very patient with me <laughs> because I arrived in his studio as a modern violinist. And, and the moment I set foot, <laughs> you know, on, on the soil of Bloomington, I realized I loved broke violin so much. And so I ended up splitting my time really 50 50 percent between the two instruments and Alex was so um, welcoming to the idea and so patient with me and very forgiving as I figured out exactly what you're saying how to deal with the two different techniques and so I really appreciate and love him for that but um, yeah the techniques are very different um, on modern violin you sustain the sound a lot more and you have like a constant vibrato those are things that are looked at as being good things. And on the Baroque violin, those two qualifications are not good. <laughs> you want to use vibrato as like a accent or an ornament or a slight warming of the sound, but you don't use it continuously. And you certainly don't sustain the sound. The Baroque bow isn't even meant to, to be able to do that. And so when you're playing both instruments, it's totally possible, but you kind of have to split your mind in two and see them as two very different instruments. They're both violin, but in a way they're completely different. So you just have to realize that you're learning two completely different um, things. But let's see, where am I going with this? Um, when I was at Indiana, well, I spent a lot of time practicing really because you have to practice each instrument. And when you're switching back and forth constantly, you know, it takes a good 30 minutes to realize, you know, which one you're on and how to play it and, you know, how to deal with that. So in the end, now I don't play 
I, I wouldn't say I don't play modern anymore. And this is a difficulty we have with terminology. I would say I don't play on steel strings anymore. Um, and it's very rare I'll play with a modern bow unless I'm doing contemporary music. And that's just because I don't have time to keep up the two totally different worlds like that. But on Baroque violin, as a Baroque violinist, I actually play repertoire up through, you know, Schoenberg. It's just that I play it on gut strings and I change the equipment according to what music I'm playing. So it's just a tricky thing we have with terminology that we say Baroque violin and modern violin, but they do kind of cross over in a gray area at some point. Thanks. You mentioned gut strings. For someone who listening right now, what is a gut string? Where are gut strings coming from? I know you know the answer to this, which is why I'm asking, but but <laughs> what are your thoughts on gut strings and steel strings and what the difference in sound is? Yeah. Well, the the steel strings um are you know what the majority of people play on. It's sort of the standardized string to use now. And um, they have like a very glossy, shimmery sound, and they're very well suited to the modern bow, which is about power and sustain. They're a very powerful string. Um, I mean, if you've ever had a steel E string snap in your face, you know that can hurt, and you can just see like the power and the tension that is the violin is strung up with. And the gut strings are, they're actually made out of gut. Um, there's different kinds you can get, like I usually buy sheep gut, but you can get pig gut and different things. Or if you're against that, you can get silk strings, um, which were also used in the Baroque era. And honestly, steel strings were actually used as well. So strings is a bit of a convoluted topic, but I usually play on, on sheep gut. Um, and the sound is very warm. And I like to think of it as being very human because there are like your strings will have good days and bad days and there are a lot of variables to them and factors that you can't rely on they could squeak or squawk at any moment um if it's a very human day they might just only squeak and not really make a beautiful sound um they're very rely reliant on the weather and the temperature and the humidity around them so i was actually laughing because Normally for an E string, it'll pop after about two weeks. So I'm changing my E string out about one to two weeks. And now during this confinement period with the, with the virus, my E string has, is on, it's, oh, what is it? It's been two months and like a week now, which is unheard of for a gut string. I mean, that's unheard of. And I'm getting worried it's gonna pop in my face. But um, yeah, so gut strings are very temperamental, but they're very warm and beautiful and they, like when you vibrate on them and you're up in a high position, they kind of have this like trembly, sort of sentimental choky quality that really reminds me of the human voice. So you can have a lot of fun with them for sure. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on gut strings. And um, I know that, you know, because of technology, we actually have companies out there that combine gut and steel strings to, to provide that warmth sound, which is exactly what you just said where it's a very warm, uh, nurturing sound. And I uh, appreciate your, your, your thoughts on, on the whole conversation about strings. But I do want to talk about the bow, because you mentioned the bow a couple of times where modern bows, um, the, the modern design by Tort is definitely, what you're using probably is something, a design before that time period, right? So can you give... A, a crash course for someone who's listening and is not and can you help them visualize what a what a baroque bow looks like and how you use it compared to steel strings in opposed to gut strings mm -hmm. yeah um so basically if we're looking at the baroque era um which is a long time period um things varied very much from country to country and city to city because there just wasn't there wasn't any way to codify things the way there is now that communication was more difficult travel was more difficult and so when we talk about baroque playing and historical performance practice we actually accidentally make a lot of generalizations that don't necessarily aren't necessarily true 
So when I say a Baroque bow, that's a huge generalization because depending whether you're in Leipzig or Paris or, you know, Florence, it's like the bows are going to be different. And if you go into any um, music instrument collection at a museum and look at the different bows from that time period, you can see like the huge difference in all of them and how there's just tons of different styles. But basically, the one thing that kind of remains true is that the Baroque bow has a very different shape from the modern, like where the modern kind of caves in in the middle, the Baroque bow actually goes outwards. So it's more of like a spring. And at the tip, it's tapered a lot more. It's a longer tip and it's tapered out. It has like a kind of like a swell downwards, whereas the modern bow has like that square shape. Um, and with that taper, that's what makes it so that the Baroque bow cannot actually sustain. I think it probably can if you really, really muscle it, but it would be very difficult to do and extremely awkward. Um, if you're even just playing strokes back and forth in the middle of the bow and you keep your bow on the string, with the broke bow, it's going to sound like you're coming off the string because there is like a little stop before each down and up bow, um, which is great when you're playing fast passage work, like in a Bach partita or something, you get that kind of crisp like sauté effect without having to actually come off the string like with a modern bow. So it can be very elegant and light and kind of dancey. Um, but yeah, it really depends on the on the time period. I have a whole collection of bows and I want so many more. Like I'm just addicted to bows because I want to have each one for each composer. Like I have a short Italian bow, which basically looks like a hunk of like driftwood <laughs> that washed up on the beach. It's like this very primitive looking thick stick. It's probably the thickest stick you'll ever see for a violin. Um, and it's very, very short. And that I use for Bieber. And you basically can't really do, do much with it. And the way you hold it is the way we learn. Like if you ever did Suzuki method and you put your thumb under the frog of the bow, that's actually how you hold this early broke bow. So there's no way to do any kind of like subtleties or coming off the string. It's just like you put the bow on the string and you play. And that's my early Bieber bow. My broke bow is longer and more elegant. Um, and I have a, a transitional bow for classical music. And well, it's too early really for romantic music. So it sort of depends. I'm, I'm looking for a bow now to play things like Brahms with um, and Beethoven. Yeah, so it, it's a huge topic, bows. Wonderful. I have uh, many bow maker slash bow restorer friends, and I'm always so curious about talking about bows because for me, if you think in artistic terms, the violin is your canvas, but uh, the bow is kind of your brush. And, mm -hmm. the you know, different brushes do different things and different sounds. And I always love talking about different bows like torp bows and... Um, and what you said was interesting that each town in Europe had a different style of bow. So that was, that was actually something that I learned uh, I didn't know prior to that. Mm -hmm. I want to transition, Augusta, to your time in Paris. After the two years you've moved, what has your performance career been like um, during the COVID-19 pandemic? I know that for me, I do a lot of teaching, so a lot of my violin classes and violin lessons have been geared towards Zoom lessons and Skype lessons, you know, video lessons in general. And a lot of musicians around the world, their performances have been canceled, right, to the unforeseeable future, because we don't know how long this is going to take. Can you talk about what's going on in your area, in France, in Europe, what the music performance climate is like over there at, at this time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's you know, a really difficult time. And I feel so much for all my fellow musicians who have had performances canceled. Um, it's just really hard. But to put a positive spin on it, the one thing that has been so incredible in this and living through this um, like historical moment is seeing all of us come together and discussing our cancellations and discussing what we're doing now and doing projects together and all of that. And so I, I really, really appreciate and admire that. It's like we've all come together all around the world and I think that's so cool. Um, 
so I have definitely, it's been a hard couple months and it's going to be difficult for a while. I had a lot of performances canceled. I don't know how many, I don't want to count. <laughs> but um, I, I was supposed to do four seasons. Actually, most of my stuff in the spring was in the United States. I was supposed to do four seasons with Indianapolis Broke. And I was supposed to lead Bach Academy Charlotte um, for their June festival um, and many other things. And it's been really sad to see all of that, you know, not happen. Um, although luckily a lot of things are postponed for 2021. But here in Paris, um, a lot of us have been doing videos together. So we're kind of like making chamber music over the internet. Um, my roommate is a, is a harpsichordist, Sam Crowther, and he is in Toulouse right now. Um, but we're actually, actually this is a good reminder, I need to put the video together, but we are doing a little like Bach sonata together um, with video, which is really cool. So we're finding ways to make music. Um, I know like one of the main orchestras I play with here is Les Arflorissants, and they've been contacting us to record, you know, short like, um, snippets of things like playing or saying hello or whatever and they've been creating montages for their audiences just to you know for us to be able to say hi to our public which is really cool so there's all sorts of things you can do um for me i've actually i mean i'm practicing a ton which is great to have the time to do that because i don't always actually have time to practice um but what i've been doing is learning how to do videos and how to do video editing um, and so I'm working with Voices of Music. They have a stay at home project and they've set me up. You can kind of see it behind me actually, but there's like a, I have a black backdrop um, set up, some LED lights, some microphones. And so I'm creating videos and I've been learning the magical wonders of Adobe Premiere Pro. <laughs> and for me as like a totally not technologically savvy person it's been a huge journey and adventure and i think it's great though because when all of this is over i'll have a new skill that i never had before so i've been really concentrating on that and that's been that's been fun I'm kind of getting a lot of Bach recordings out out there and basically every other solo unaccompanied violin piece there is <laughs> i'm working on some paganini i i enjoyed your Paganini Caprice um, videos I saw on Facebook. I've been working on some Paganini on the Baroque violin, which is a whole nother, a whole nother story. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's kind of been what's going on. I'm curious to know what people are going to envision the music world after this pandemic. I know that a lot of us are trying to build new skills. I think this is the time to build new skills in an uh, in an ever changing musical landscape. I know that, and and you can comment to, comment on this. I hope where sometimes I felt like when I was in school in my undergrad and masters, they're there to teach you music, but mm -hmm. all these extra skills that we're trying to work on right now, like video editing skills and audio editing. You know, I definitely didn't learn how to podcast when I was in school. At least in my yeah. undergrad, in my in my masters, I started playing around with it, and I really started to enjoy it. But there was never this uh, conversation in including tech in a classical music classroom. Uh, can you talk about the importance of including technology in today's curriculum? If you have any thoughts on that, yeah, I'm sure that is something we're going to see entering into the classroom at conservatories. Absolutely, um, I think having an internet presence was always important to me and um the moment i graduated from juilliard i did try to build that and i do think it's important to teach that in conservatories because that is definitely a skill we're going to need in, in you know in the future um so i did a guest lecture at university of kentucky in the fall and i, I talked about social media and how to use it and what to do with that but I think after, after all of this um, passes, it'll go beyond social media. Like you say, we'll be seeing, um, you know, we'll need to be talking about and learning ourselves, editing, video. I think video is a huge um, part of the future. Um, audio editing, absolutely. I don't know what's going to happen after all this passes. And I think that's something that all of us musicians are super nervous about. 
And of course, growing up as a classical musician, having ties to that, I don't know, that tradition and that history of going to concerts. And, you know, that's something that's so important to me. And I have no trouble sitting through a five hour opera. So that side of me is totally nervous about if things change in the future and if it does go in more of like a technology direction. I'm really nervous about that. But on the other hand, it could be a good thing. It could be great. I mean, it's certainly, you know, with TikTok and all of that, it's certainly the way of the future. And so maybe it'll be good for classical music in the end. I mean, maybe all of this will be something of a silver lining. But there's, you know, we can't guess. That we'll just have to see how it plays out. But I think for everyone, we just have to be as ready as we can and um, have our eyes open and be open to possibilities. and everything will work out. I think a lot of us are asking that question right now, where what I, I, right now in the U.S., we're, you know, there are governors in the U.S. who are talking about a slow reopening of the economy. And I think what medical professionals and governors, what they're trying to say is, is that you have to turn the dial up very slowly for people to start gaining trust and going into public spaces again. And I think that's going to be a huge challenge for classical music. And if you're listening to the podcast, please leave a comment on what do you think we can do or have any creative solutions to solve this problem. Definitely technology is going to be uh, an issue. Social media obviously is the future. It's not going away anytime soon. Facebook is here to stay. Instagram, TikTok, they're all here to stay. So I think what I struggle with in, in any kind of education system is that the classical music is sometimes a little behind the game in terms of where it is in the present. And I think what we're learning right now and all the people who are trying to figure this all out, we're going to be talking about this 10 years from now and then teach it 10 years from now as opposed to, as opposed to teaching it today. And that's going to be an interesting conversation. And if you have any thoughts on that, please leave them in the comments below, either on YouTube or on um, any podcast platform of your choice. So Augusta, you mentioned Bach. I love Bach and I'm sure you love Bach too. Can you talk about Bach for a little bit and why you're passionate about Bach? Yeah. Um, it's funny, actually. I didn't consciously realize it until this coronavirus thing but I've been very scared of Bach my whole life. I, um, I have a CD out called Beyond Bach and Cavaldi, and there's no Bach on that CD. I am so reticent to record Bach. And I think, because for me, it's like, it's a dual issue. Bach is so incredible, and there have been so many incredible performances of Bach, but there's that already to deal with. And then, with the performance practice part of it, I feel like there's a lot that Bach has to say that we haven't discovered yet, that we're not used to with his language. Um, we need to look at the context within which he lived and who he was and try to get into his brain somehow and see how he was thinking and see what his musical language is. So there's also that issue of like the unknown with Bach and, and, and being unsure if we've really deciphered his language. And then suddenly, um, during this shutdown, I found myself practicing so much Bach. I've worked through all of the sonatas and partitas now, except for the C major um, in these two months. And I've recorded a bunch of them and I feel completely at home with him now. And I think there was like this fear hurdle. So now I'm totally on this Bach path and I'm going for it and I'm loving discovering his music. Um, and I, I'm sure a lot of people feel this way, actually. I'm guessing. And I think um, if I could say anything, it would be, you know, just go for it and really spend time with him. And I think this is a great time to do that. I've really enjoyed the process. I think I was told by a teacher in my undergrad, this person who was given a string seminar lecture in uh, Boston, where I went to school, I, for my undergrad. And I think, I forget if it, was, if it was this teacher, if it was another teacher, but I think this teacher said, you like more if you know more. And if you start to understand Bach or, tr or be open to the idea of exploring him a little more, I think you're going to enjoy his music more. 
And, you know, Bach is a very personal composer because uh, everyone has a different thing to say when you look at Bach's music. And I'm sure that's the case for you. Um, one of my favorites is the third partita in E major. It's one of my favorites. I love it. Uh, just, it just brings a lot of joy to my life. You know, I can, I can be in any age and I think that I can always rely on that partita to, you know, cheer me up. Is there a specific sonata or partita that you're exploring during the shutdown that you ha had a real connection with? It's funny you had mentioned the, the third partita because that has been the one like pillar in my life kind of that I've always gotten along with. I've always loved it. I just think it's such a like, I don't know, happy and vivacious piece. And it has like, these perfect like two worlds of Bach, which is like the dancey Baroque quality, and then also his his rhetoric and his you know contrapuntal style, and I just love that piece. But I've also been um, going through the the D minor partita number two, and right now I'm working on the Chaconne. I recorded the first two movements at Skillman Studios actually one week before the shutdown in New York. So before everything shut down, I was in New York. Um, I was playing with this orchestra, American Classical, and we actually played the final concert at Lincoln Center before everything closed, which is very bittersweet. And I'm sure it's going to be very nostalgic for me in the future. Um, and so while I was there in New York, I asked my friend, who is the head of Skillman Music, and he's the one who recorded my CD, Jan Bach, I said, hey, do you want to, you know, I'm here, do you want to do some Bach videos? And this was before the virus was really a huge threat on my mind. And so we recorded these two, these two movements, the Alamand and the Courant from the D minor. And then everything, you know, happened and I scurried back to Paris and for the confinement period. And so I thought, well, I've recorded those two movements and that was fun. And so now I should continue, you know, looking at the rest of it. And so now I'm working on the Chaconne and I haven't played the Chaconne since I was 12 years old. So it's been really, really cool to do that. And I think I've changed a lot since I was 12. <laughs> so my interpretation has changed a lot and it's great to have the time to discover that because that's quite a few years that have passed and quite a lot of changes to make. So. Wonderful, thanks, your, thanks for sharing your thoughts on Bach. I, I love everything that you said. That was so awesome. Let's talk about your competition and what you did to prepare for those competitions. Part of the reason I started the Violin Podcast is to make it more accessible for any violinist in the world to get practice tips um, in an audio format. And I think, uh, well, let me let me go back to the reason why I started podcasting. And it was because I watched an interview with Stephen Colbert, who's a late night television show host in the United States, and Malcolm Gladwell, who is a very well-renowned researcher um, and he was doing an interview with Stephen Colbert and Stephen Colbert asked the same question. Well, you know, you've been writing so many books, so why go into podcasting? And he said something that I'll never forget with you think with your eyes, but you but you feel with your ears. And I just loved that. And I felt like podcasting did that for me. And I feel that music does that for us which is why, you know, I'm having such a blast podcasting with so many, you know, hope, you know, making new friends. And anyways, that was a total tangent. Yeah. But, <laughs> but no, I love that. But uh, I want to talk about your, your, you know, competition preparation when you were doing competitions. And if you want to uh, also listen to another interesting perspective on competition preparation. I encourage people who are listening to go to the, the first episode with Galia Costner, who a student at Colburn, and she has a lot of valuable tips on competition preparation. But I'm curious to know what your thoughts are and how you prepare for your competitions. Yeah, definitely. Um, there were a few years there where I was doing a lot of competitions, um, pretty much consecutive years. And it was fantastic. I grew so much. Um, after each competition, I would always say to whoever, you know, a close friend or whoever I was close to at that time, I would always say, 
never let me do another competition. <laughs> like whether I had lost or whether I had won, I would, after it was all finished, I would always say, you have to remind me because I know myself and I know in one year I'm going to want to do another. And you have to remind me that I said to never do another because the toll it takes on you is huge to prepare for an international competition. I mean, it's just huge. Um, but I never listened to the, to the never do this in me. I always continue to do them and I'm so glad because they've done a lot for me. Um, the very, the very first international competition I did was Musica Antica in Bruges. And I wasn't sure if I should do it because if you haven't done one before, it's really hard to know whether you're ready. So I think that was probably the competition I prepared for the hardest. And I was practicing six or seven hours a day. And that was while I was at Indiana also doing modern violin. So it was very difficult, but it was such an incredible experience. I, for that one, I made it to semifinals and it was like, I can't remember, like 150 of us showed up or something like that. And then semifinals, they cut it to 12. And so like making it to semifinals, I was like, yes, oh my gosh, like 12 people. Um, and I had to practice so much repertoire for it, but it was such a great competition. There was like a improvisation aspect to it and you played some solo Bach and then there was a concerto and it was just like really fun. Like the repertoire was so great and so varied. Um, and for that one, I think, I mean, it's hard to remember because it's been a few years, but the preparation, I remember I practiced a lot and I remember for all of the competitions, one thing I did was I would do run throughs every two to three days actually, um, just to be so ready, like on the spot when you're running through all that repertoire, what's going to happen? You know, you have like, it's physically taxing, it's emotionally taxing for the concentration. So just to be like really used to that, every two, every three days. I, I've always done that and that's super helpful, I think. Um, and also to play for people as much as you can beforehand. So you just know, I think the main thing with competition is to know like on the spot, on that stage in front of the jury, you need to know like what your pitfalls are gonna be, um, where the tricky sections are, practice the easy sections as much as you practice the hard sections because often that's gonna be where you mess up, you know, that kind of thing. So just the preparation is so huge. And then once you get to the competition, they usually last like 10 days or something. And one, one thing that's really taxing for me emotionally is the fact that you, you know, your name gets drawn, you play the first round, and then there might be three more days of prelims that you have to wait through not knowing whether you've made it or not. And so it's like this weird balance of having to like practice so much for the next round, but also not knowing if you've made it. And I think one of the important things is, to, is like to be so ready before you get there that during those three days, you don't have to practice more than two or three hours and you can kind of relax and just like, you know, sightsee around whatever city you're in and kind of have fun at that point. Um, yeah, because I think it's really important to keep like a good mental balance of like normal person and then like practicing like crazy musician robot. <laughs> so that would be what I felt with the competitions. And I don't know, it's been sort of on my mind to do another one before I get too old. So I might, um, I, for the past couple of years, I've, I've been done <laughs> and I might do another. I've lost some, I've won some, and they've all been great experiences. I might go for one or two more. And then I think I'll close that chapter of my life. But yeah, competitions are a huge thing and really worth it. Awesome. Thanks for sharing all of that. And you mentioned Bruges. I love Bruges in Belgium. It's just like this fairy tale kind of town. And I remember there, I was there a few years ago, you know, non music related, but it, if you, anyone who's listening, or if you're from Belgium and you're listening, uh, please leave a comment on the best uh, place to eat in Bruges. Because next time I'm there, I want to go. <laughs> um, great. Absolutely. And same for me. Same for me. <laughs> Last but not least, before we get to my favorite part of the podcast, I want to finish off with some closing thoughts on uh, what it means to be an artist in today's world. I think that a lot of us continue to have that conversation with my, with ourselves, especially for me. I have that conversation with myself. Uh, as mentioned in the first episode, I was like, you know, I hold this wooden box and I go, what the heck is this? I make a living with this how do I do it? What do I do with it? Where do I do it? 
you know, these are constant questions that we're asking ourselves. And I just want to have you share your thoughts to the audience listening. What does it mean to you to be a musician in 2020? Yeah, and I, I think that's such a great question, um, especially right now. And so thank you for asking it. Um, there are definitely, of course, like I think for every musician, there are days where we do think that it's like, what are we doing with this weird box, like you say, um, that we spend our entire days with. And I think the only reminder we need is playing for our audience and seeing the feedback that we get. And right now, I feel that question is so applicable because just before COVID-19, I was feeling really burnt out. Um, a typical season for me usually involves one to two um, transatlantic flights per month. And I'm usually home in Paris for like one week a month at best with my US stuff and then with European orchestra tours as well. It's like I'm almost never home. And I was feeling so burnt out and kind of wondering what, you know, not what the point of it all is, but, you know, what I was doing with that little wooden box. And now I think um, it's become so clear how important music is and how important the arts in general are. Um, all the live streams we're doing over the internet right now, the feedback I've gotten has been totally um, moving and just really emotional. A lot of people saying that music is the only thing brightening their days right now and that they find what we do to be so beautiful and so important. Um, and just those kind of reactions from so many people around the world, I, it's just the only reminder I need to realize how important music is, classical music is to, to everyone. Um, there's just nothing quite like it. It's really food for the heart. And I think, you know, in our hearts, deep underneath it all we know that and that's why we continue to practice the hours we do and to prepare the music that we prepare um and that's why we became musicians in the first place and that's just so beautiful and i don't think anything can take that away from us i couldn't have said it better myself thank you for sharing your thoughts augusta now my favorite part of the podcast and that is violin podcast trivia and for those of you who are listening for the first time we well, most not we, but me, I get to ask each guest five questions in 25 seconds. And the goal is they need to get three out of the five questions right in order to get a prize from me. So that is so fun. And for every single contestant that has come on, for now it's been two. Uh, <laughs> the first episode, Gali Costner, she was like, oh my God, I don't know. Eric, I'm not a trivia person, but we'll see. And she ended up winning. So, I, th you know, congrats to her. So um, definitely listen to that. Oh, yeah. I'm going to let you down so much. I'm literally going to get zero right. Uh. <laughs> For the record, these are all violin related. So these are all answers you know or you know in the back of your mind, but you might have to have a refresher. So... Okay, so I, for people who are listening on you, uh, watching, not listening, watching on YouTube, um, I have my watch right here and I'm very strict with my time. So I will go ahead, five, four, three, two, one. Question one, what year was Bach born? Uh, 1685. What's Handel's full name? Uh, Georg Friedrich Handel. How many passions did Bach compose? Oh, gosh, two. <laughs> How many fantasies did Telmon write? Twelve. What key is the first chord in Bach's first violin solo sonata? G minor. And we got time. Wow, you did pretty well. I don't know if you did pretty well. I have, I have the answers right here, though. That's the scariest thing I've ever done. I was more nervous than for any performance. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was wonderful. I think you, I think you held yourself really well. So we'll see how, we'll see how you do. Okay. So do you need three out of five questions, right? Okay. Question one, what year was Bach born? You said 1685. 1685 is correct. So that's one. ka -ching. What's Handel's full name? You said George, your Friedrich Handel. 
that was also correct. This great. You s- and then the third one you weren't so sure. You kind of panicked, answered right. How many passions did Bach compose? And you said how many did you say? I think I said two. You, th- you think you said two. You'll have is to two the correct answer. <laughs> yes, it is two passions. There's Saint John and Saint Matthew. The third one. How many fantasies did Talmud write? You said twelve. Twelve is correct. And what key in the first chord in Bach's first violin solo sonata? You said G minor, and G minor is correct. So you are the first contestant to get all five questions right, and as a result, you get a violin podcast mug from me. Yes. That's so exciting. Yes. So it is an exclusive item. It's not even for sale yet. So you are gonna wow. get. Wow. You're gonna get one. So, Augusta, it was such a pleasure to meet you and talk, and to share your th- and for you to share your thoughts on music and classical music and your career as a broke violinist. I really appreciate it. And if you want to learn more about Augusta, uh, I'll leave uh, links down in the description below so you can get to know Augusta, what she's up to. And all that sort of thing. And if you enjoyed listening to the Violin Podcast,、uh, please subscribe、uh, on YouTube.、Uh, make sure you subscribe and also click the bell notifications. We do episodes on the second and fourth week of each month. And for anyone who's listening via voice, thank you so much for listening. Please、uh, leave a comment, subscribe, and leave those notifications on. Agusta, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Eric.